Welcome. And uh, we'll start off with our bracha. Baruch Ata Adonai Loheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. Amen. Thank you. Um, so if you tuned in yesterday, you realize that we are not doing Rashi now. We completed all the Rashis on the two Parshas that are combined for this coming week, this Shabbat. And so we are looking at Torah Tmima, which is a more, uh, it's a higher level of commentary. And it also gets into Halakha, into Jewish law quite a bit. Uh, and and um, he shows his expertise. Rabbi Baruch HaLevi Epstein uh, demonstrates his clear expertise in these particular matters. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen at this point, and we'll see what we can find. So yesterday, yesterday, we're so we're at the beginning of this parsha again of Atem Nitzavim, that is uh, chapter twenty nine in the book of Deuteronomy, and starting with verse nine, and we're going to go on to verse ten, and where Moses starts this section, uh, declaring who he is addressing, uh, the various components of the Israelite nation, and how they are all to be brought in to this formal relationship, this covenant with God. And we're into the next verse, so we're on to verse 10, uh, where he's talking about, he goes on to say, Tapchem, your children, Neshechem, your wives, the Gercha, Asher Bekerev Machanecha, and the Gercha would be a person who was originally not of Jewish extraction or Israelite extraction, but who chose to cast their lot with the Jewish people in the midst of your camp, mechotev enech eitzecha, from your hewers of wood, ad shoev meimecha, to your drawers of water. And who is he talking about here? And that's going to be the next comment here. Mechotev etzecha v'gomer, meaning from the, your hewers of wood, etc. Hanitinim, so the nitinim, we're not going to translate that word. Uh, we will get an explanation of what this word means and how this refers to these particular class of people. Gazar Moshe al Khatunam lahahu dara. Moses made an edict regarding this class of people called the Nitinim, regarding marrying them for that generation, meaning that he prohibited Israelites from marrying these Nitinim for that generation. Shinne'emar, as it says, mechotev etzecha, from your hewers of wood, etc. Uh, uh, why that works is not clear. Okay, so if you're puzzled by that or don't follow, you're in good company. Okay, the Atta David and David, King David, came, the Gazar Alaihu, and he made an edict regarding these Nitinim, the Chule Dare, for all generations. So there's a lot of explaining that needs to happen here, and we will see if we get any satisfaction as to how this works. Okay, so let's take a look. So this is footnote Chet. We'll take a look here. So first of all, who the Nitinim were. A Nitinim heim hagiv onim. We're talking about this group of people called the Gibeonites. They're mentioned expi explicitly in the book of Joshua. And uh, we are going, to, there's a story and a chapter that this Gibe these Gibeonites were a tribe that were not of Israelite extraction. They lived in that general region. And when they heard of the success of Joshua and the Israelites and how they were conquering the Canaanites, the Gibeonites uh, dressed themselves up. They made themselves look as if they come from a far distant, distant country. 
and they came to Joshua. They sent representatives who came to Joshua, and their clothes were torn, etc. They looked like they'd taken a long journey, and they said, you know, we live from a distant area, and we'd like to make a treaty with you, a pact with you, and Joshua did not do much investigation, and he wound up making a pact with these Gibeonites. And then they found out that these Gibeonites were like next door neighbors and that they had made this agreement under false pretenses. And so this is why Joshua uh, declared that while he would hold on to the agreement that he made, that he would they would not be attacked, they were going to now become, there was still going to be a penalty for what they'd done to become hewers of wood and drawers of water, that they would have to take on menial tasks. So, the Gibeonites, Shanit Gairu Bimei Yehoshua, that they, they associated, they became Israelites during the days of Joshua. Uveze hit uhu the Yehoshua, and regarding this, they hit uh, uh, uhu means that they they basically may they they um, oh gosh uh, they tricked right they tricked Joshua kenoda bakatuv as is learned from the verses there. Velachin netanam lechotve etzim la mizbeach, and for that reason they became hewers of wood for the altar. They needed to do that. And again, the chapter is in Joshua chapter 9. This is a quotation. Joshua made them on that day. He declared that they would now become hewers of wood, wood choppers, and water drawers. Alshim Nitina Zoi. See, we've got this. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, here, you see this verb, Vayit name. He gave them over to, he made them. So you've got this root, Vayit name. This is the root in the text itself. And he says, Vayit Nitina zo. And because of this Nitina, this giving them over to this. Zo nikru nitinim. They became known as nitinim, as people who had been given over to these tasks. For David Hamelech Gazar Alehem, and regarding David the king, King David, he made an edict concerning them: Shelo lehitchatem bahem, that Israelites were not allowed to marry them, mipnei shehikiram leachzarim, because he recognized that they were cruel people. They had no consideration for other people. They had a quality of cruelty, and he didn't want Israelites being associated with and married to people who were cruel. The Ein Zeh Mimidot Yisrael, cruelty is not supposed to be one of the qualities of an Israelite. For an Israelite to be cruel, is against the very nature of what it means to be an Israelite. Okay, Mimi Dot Israel, Kshayrim, that is to say, Israelites who are bona fide Israelites, Zera Avraham, who are of the seed of Abraham. Abraham was essentially known for his and Sarah for their hospitality to strangers, not just hospitality, but hospitality to strangers. And we associate the term chesed, which is kindness with Abraham. And kindness is the absolute opposite of cruelty. The motions involved, the behavior involved, it represents the antithesis of cruelty. And kindness, since we are the, this is part of what we mean to say that we are the descendants of Abraham. To be a descendant here in the literary sense means to hold on to his values, etc., Okay, Iyen Lamala, he says, he gives you a reference to check above the Parsha Tra'e in the Parsha of Re'e in Deuteronomy, or be Pasuk Yud Gimel, or, or Yud Perek Yud Gimel Yud Chet, okay, as it says, possibly this is uh, chapter 13, is it, could it be? Yes, 
and verse 18, possibly, Venatan Lecha Rachamim, where Moses says to the Israelites, and gives you mercy, which can be understood as that God has given you the quality of mercy, of kindness. For Amar Khan, and here it says, Al Zeh, regarding this, Degam Ka'ele Shehayu Bime Moshe, that there were people like this, like the Gibeonites, during the days of Moses, that there were also people who came under a pretense and got, got an agreement through uh, a ruse. Klomar, that is to say, Avadim Shinit Gairu, so we were talking about slaves that became uh, that became Israelites that associated with the Israelites. Shelo l'shem shamayim. It wasn't because they believed so much that they believed in one God and believed in the Torah. That was not the main reason. Rak l'shem ezo uh, ezo pnia, but it had to do with some other reason, some other turning, I guess you could translate that literally, right? That there was some other benefit that they felt they would get by becoming Israelites and not because they were so wholehearted in their belief in God and in God's Torah. Gazar Moshe Alehem. So Moses made an edict regarding them, not to intermarry with them. And we we make this whole this whole interpretation, right, that we just made regarding these people uh, that came during the days of Moses, okay, because uh, because they were referred to as hewers of wood, as wood choppers, the shovei mayim, and water drawers, the anfaihu regarding them, right? They, they're referred to in the same way. Shmamina, from this we can deduce, uh, love Biklal Yisrael Haim, that because they were separated out and designated specifically, they were not part of the community of Israel, not in general of Israelites. The love Biklal Gerim, and nor were they considered to be Gerim. Remember, Gerim is mentioned as people who joined the became part of the Jewish people for sincere reasons because they fell in love with the notion of God and and worshiping God and following God's commandments ela avadim the avadim psulim ninhu rather they were considered to be slaves or servants and not only that they were considered pasul meaning unfit to become Israelites, mean who they were, they were considered. The Omnam Hugazar, and nevertheless, Moses understood he made an edict, Rakla or Tohador, just for that specific generation. Because Moses thought, that in future generations, Yishtane Tivam their nature would change, that they would change their nature, miliyot achsarim, from being cruel, that they wouldn't be so cruel in the future. Aval David, but regarding David, all those generations later, shekvar ra'ah dorot havaim, because he saw all the coming generations, the hikiram b'cholze la'achsarim, and he recognized that despite all this time that had gone by, they still were cruel. Gazar alehim adolam, for that reason, his edict was in perpetuity. Kach nire lefaresh. This appears to be an appropriate way to explain all of this. So I think we've gotten a little bit of an explanation uh, of, of this particular sentence up here and uh, how how it uh, the fact that he refers to them specifically as this. I think we uh, that uh, Rabbi Baruch HaLevi Epstein, the Torah Tmima, does in fact say how you derive it from the fact that he is singling this out for these particular people, to refer to these particular people in this way.
Any thoughts or questions at this point before we move on? Any clarification required? Okay. All right. Let me go a little further then. So notice the next verse, Uva Allah to. So what is this Allah? What is this word Allah? Sometimes it's translated as curse, but there's a specific, it isn't simply a curse. A curse is a klala. That's the Hebrew word that we use for curse. So what is an Allah? So, Ain Allah el he says, in, this is from the Yerushalmi, the the, tra the, palace, the Yerushalmi Talmud, Tractate Sota, Chapter 2, Halakha 5, that it simply means an oath, that the Allah Tor means an oath. Um, and I would say that an Allah has to do with the fact that there are penalties for not keeping the oath, that that's, it's an oath that has penalties attached in some way. That would seem to me a way to understand what's being said here. And so we have an example of how an Allah is associated with an oath. It states in Parshat Naso, in the book of Numbers, there's a parsha by the name of Naso. This has to do with the woman suspected of adultery, right? Who is being tested by the waters. The Hishbia ha Kohen et Haisha. So it means the Kohen should make the woman swear, right? The Shfuat ha Allah. There we go. In a Shfuat, in an oath of Allah. Right? So again, it's a type of oath, is what we're saying. Umikan da haone amen achar Shfuat. And we also learn from here that one who answers amen after a an oath. If somebody makes a take makes an oath, and you answer amen regarding that oath, kishvuah dami. It's as if you made the oath yourself. So there is some explaining here, right? So saying amen to a person's statement is as if you made that statement yourself. So just on a simple level, when I make a bracha or when someone makes a bracha and you say amen to their bracha, it's as if you are saying ditto. I'm saying it too. I affirm what you're saying. Okay. okay, let's see where we're at. We're at tent right over here. Ritzonoloma, what he's trying to say, we don't see anywhere in the text that the Israelites actually made these oaths or took any oath on this kind of level, right? And Moses is saying to them that they did, that they'd made such an oath, but there's nowhere in the text where it talks about the Israelites saying the oath, okay? So there's a question here. For Afal Pichain, and nevertheless, despite this fact, he, he says to them, he talks about them uh, if they are to uh, desecrate this covenant that they made with the Lord their God, and his Allah, this shvua that they took. Because that implies that, in fact, and indeed, they did make such an oath. They did take an oath. And for this reason, we have to say, that it was because they answered amen, that after the oaths, the declarations that were made, Shabahar Grizim, in the Mount Grizim, Uvahar Eval, and Mount Eval, we read about this, right? And they, the, the, um, the uh, Kohanim declared this, these vows and they answered Amen after each one, right? As it states, right, in those passages that it says, and all the people will answer Amen. And for that reason, this is considered as if they themselves made an oath. 
lamala, and he's giving you a rest. And he says, see above the parshat naso in the parsha of naso, the pasuk regarding the verse that says the amra haisha amen. Okay, where it says, and the woman after the the priest adjures her, she says amen. Ba od rashim. Uh, where we will see other interpretations just like the one I gave here. And this is where we will stop today. And I'll make the little marking. Excuse me. Okay. Down here. All right. Very good. I'm going to stop the share. All right. How did we do today, Kathleen? Uh, you're muted. I got it better this time. Um, so the Gibbonites, is that the way you pronounce it? Gibbonites. Gibbonites. Yes. We're just there to escape being killed. Correct. That okay. was the motivation. They had no no other motivation than uh, their their own fear that the Israelites would attack and destroy them. And Joshua couldn't see through that. He did not realize they disguised. They disguised themselves, and there there was no reason he would have necessarily uh, suspected them. Okay. Yeah. And although it's interesting. Uh, one could argue, but if that happened during the days of Moses and the exact same thing happened, then why didn't he suspect them? Okay. Right. So, I mean, one can come up with reasons. It's, you know, <laughs> it's not like one doesn't make more than one mistake regarding the same thing. So, right. sadly, that's just human nature. And I'm, I hesitate to criticize Joshua given the responsibilities he had. And I'm going to stop the recording with that.